In the autumn of 1813, I left my house at Henderson on the banks of the Ohio on my way to Louisville. In passing over the barrens a few miles beyond Hardensburg, I observed the pigeons flying from northeast to southwest in greater numbers than I thought I had ever seen them before. And feeling an inclination to count the flocks that might pass within the reach of my eye in one hour, I dismounted, seated myself on an eminence, and began to mark with my pencil, making a dot for every flock that passed. In a short time, finding the task which I had undertaken impracticable as the birds poured in in countless multitudes, I rose, and counting the dots then put down, found that 163 had been made in 21 minutes. I traveled on, and still met more the farther I proceeded. The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots not unlike melting flakes of snow, and the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. Martha died on September 1st, 1914, in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was 29. While it's not unusual for celebrities to die tragically young, Martha wasn't your average Hollywood starlet. She was something even more rare, an endling, the last member of her species. With her death, the passenger pigeon became extinct. Just a few hundred years earlier, these birds are estimated to have numbered between three and five billion. Their flocks were so large that when they passed, they could literally darken the sky for hours, as you heard in the first-hand account by John James Audubon in the intro. So how did we get from the passenger pigeon, making up as much as 40% of the total bird population of North America, to now? What was it about them that allowed them to be so abundant until they weren't? And are they really gone for good? Turns out their extinction and potential de-extinction comes down to a clash between their biology and our technology. 500 years ago, North America looked very different than it does today. Vast forests covered much of the eastern half of the continent, from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean, from southern Canada to northern Florida. And in those forests lived passenger pigeons. They weren't especially flashy birds. If you saw one perched on a branch outside your window today, you'd probably think, yeah, that's a pigeon, or if you happen to be a birder, you might mistake it for a larger than average morning dove. But the chance that you would see only one passenger pigeon in a tree is what really set them apart from their still living relatives, because you'd pretty much never see just one. In the late winter or early spring, they would collect into huge flocks to migrate from the southern forests where they'd spent the winter to their northern breeding grounds. Imagine for a second, hundreds of millions of pigeons flying from Atlanta to Philadelphia or Detroit every March. And wherever they stopped to roost for the night or in bad weather, felt the effects. They toppled trees, they broke branches under their weight, they left carpets of poop behind them that choked out grasses and other plants. These stopover points were so dense with pigeons, they would literally roost on top of each other. Once they reached their nesting grounds, though, they spread out of it. And by a bit, I mean over 80 square kilometers on average, with estimates ranging from 15 to 50 nests per tree. They would stay in these sites for about a month in the late spring or early summer, with each pair of pigeons laying just a single egg, and the whole colony often laying their eggs on the same day. This synchronized breeding strategy, along with their enormous flocks, was probably an anti-predator adaptation called predator satiation, literally being too numerous for all the local predators to eat them all. Which is kind of ironic for a couple of reasons. The first is that the preferred food source of the passenger pigeon used that same evolutionary strategy. The huge forests of mixed hardwoods like oak, chestnut, and beech that the pigeons lived in do what's called masting where every couple of years they produce a gigantic amount of seeds and nuts all at once. Where and when the tree's mast changes from year to year, which means the pigeons had to go find it, and the huge size of their flocks meant lots and lots of eyes looking for food. And they would absolutely clean house wherever they found enough mast. They were the ultimate seed predators that could not be satiated. And predator satiation is also ironic because, well, when we're the predators, all bets are off. Here's where the clash between pigeon biology and human technology comes into the picture in the 1800s. Now before then, both Native Americans and colonists had hunted passenger pigeons, first for food and later because they were seen as pests that destroyed crops. 
And you might have heard that we hunted the passenger pigeon to extinction, and that is true in a sense. But it wasn't because we had some new or especially advanced weapon with which to hunt them. I mentioned before that the pigeon flocks moved around unpredictably because their huge numbers required finding equally huge amounts of mast and other food resources. They could fly hundreds of miles per day in search of food. And this presented a challenge for hunters because it made the birds a moving target. And in the days before phones, how was a hunter supposed to know where they were? And if the birds happened to be roosting or nesting in a particular area, why pay someone else to hunt them? They were easy enough to net or shoot for food on your own. It turns out the two pieces of technology that spelled doom for the passenger pigeon were the answers to those questions. Not some new gun, but the telegraph and the railroad. The telegraph allowed the locations of nesting colonies to spread much faster than simple word of mouth. At the peak of hunting, there were something like a thousand professional pigeoners dedicated to getting the meat of these birds to market. Additionally, the expansion of the railroad network to cover most of the U.S. east of the Mississippi meant that by the early 1860s, the pigeoners could quickly get their product to big cities like Chicago and New York. It also made shipping huge numbers of pigeons possible. One account of a nesting harvest in 1860 saw over 100,000 pounds of meat sent by train to distant markets. And the nesting colonies were the primary targets of the professional pigeoners because the young birds were easy prey. Ultimately, these nesting hunts meant that entire generations of passenger pigeons were lost before they could replace themselves, before they could even leave their nests. And if the parents escaped slaughter, they wouldn't lay another egg that season, causing the population to plummet. What was once a successful anti-predator strategy couldn't hold up in the face of humans hunting for the market. In 1887, the last reported colonial nesting of the passenger pigeon happened in Wisconsin. It was unsuccessful, probably due to hunters disturbing the birds. They abandoned the site after about two weeks. Just a few years later, in 1902, the last confirmed shooting of a passenger pigeon in the wild took place in Indiana. By March 1909, the entire population consisted of Martha and two males in the Cincinnati Zoo. And from July 1910 until her death in 1914, it was just Martha alone. The Endless. Her final resting place is the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where she's been part of several exhibits over the last century, eternally perched on a branch, as though pausing for a moment to watch countless humans stream past. But what would it take to see her species fly again? The extinction of the passenger pigeon happened before the conservation movement really got started, and the few legal protections that attempted to save the birds were too little too late. But are we still too late? Much like the telegraph and the railroad changed the fate of the passenger pigeon the first time around, can our technology change it again? This is the promise of de-extinction, that we can resurrect species that have no living representatives. Or at least that's how the term often gets used in things like press releases, conjuring images of woolly mammoths once again stomping across the tundra. The reality of de-extinction is more nuanced and more complicated. If you dig past the Jurassic Park-esque press coverage, groups like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the folks who maintain the red list of endangered species, give a different definition. Their guidelines focus on de-extinction as a process for creating substitutes for extinct species that resemble them in some key way for the purposes of restoring lost ecological functions. It's less about the extinct species itself and more about its former role in the ecosystem. And there are essentially three ways to do this kind of de-extinction. First, there's backbreeding. This is just a specific kind of artificial selection where instead of mating pairs of animals in hopes of producing new traits, you pick your pairs with an eye toward old traits. Of course, this requires having a living species that has some of the traits of the species you're trying to resurrect. The longest running example of this might be the attempt to backbreed the ancestor of domestic cattle, the aurochs, which some people hope to release into the grasslands of Europe to help maintain their openness and biodiversity. The second way to attempt de-extinction is through cloning. To clone an animal, you take the nucleus of an adult somatic cell, so any cell that's not an egg or sperm cell, and you stick it into an egg that has had its nucleus removed. The egg basically resets the somatic cell so it develops like a fertilized embryo inside a surrogate mother. Unlike backbreeding, cloning produces an animal that's genetically identical to the donor of the somatic cell. But you need intact living cells to do it, and we don't have those for most extinct species. 
We did do this kind of de-extinction successfully once, though, sort of. In 2003, scientists cloned an extinct subspecies of Spanish ibex, but the calf died a few minutes after birth, making this the only time we know of that a species has gone extinct twice. And the final option for de-extinction is genetic engineering. This requires sequencing and assembling the genome of an extinct species from fragments of preserved DNA, figuring out which genes go with which traits, and then editing those genes in a living cell from a close relative to match the sequence of the extinct species. Then you circle back to option two, cloning, using the edited somatic cell as your donor. But the thing is, there can be millions of genes that differ between an extinct species and their closest living relative, not to mention some species don't have living relatives close enough to use as a guide for assembling their genome. And not every extinct species left enough intact DNA behind to even sequence their whole genome. Cloning also doesn't work for animals that lay eggs. It only works in placental mammals. But that has not stopped the organization working on the de-extinction of the passenger pigeon. It's called Revive and Restore, and they aim to have hatched their first pigeons by 2032. They plan to use DNA from museum specimens of the passenger pigeon to reconstruct the genomes of multiple individuals, then edit some of the genes of their closest living relative, the band-tailed pigeon, to match. Without getting too far into the biotech weeds here, they plan to put these gene-edited cells into the gonads of rock doves, which are super easy to breed, then, when those rock doves have babies, they'll hatch out birds that are essentially part passenger pigeon, part band-tailed pigeon, which they'll then try to raise in a colony to bring out their passenger pigeon-like traits. There's a lot more to it than that, but their ultimate goal is to restore the passenger pigeon to its former role as an ecosystem engineer of eastern hardwood forests. Remember earlier when I mentioned how these birds used to break branches and topple trees and carpet the forest floor with poop whenever they stopped? Turns out, all that disturbance was actually really important for these ecosystems. In their natural state, forests essentially go through cycles. These start when a fire or storm or a gigantic flock of birds create open spaces in the canopy for light to reach the forest floor. This allows plants that couldn't grow in the shade to gain a foothold and ultimately creates a patchwork of habitats throughout a forest in different stages of what's called succession, changes in the plant community over time. This patchwork maintains biodiversity in the forest, both in terms of the plants that can grow there and also because it provides a variety of habitats used by different animals. So bringing back a version of the passenger pigeon has the potential to kickstart these cycles again, according to Revive and Restore, a technological solution to a biological problem. But at its core, does this version of de-extinction really undo what is lost when an endling dies? When the last member of a species that has persisted for thousands or millions of years meets its end, what disappears along with it that we can't preserve? We have the bodies of passenger pigeons safely tucked away in museum collections, and in those pigeon cells, their genome. We have written accounts and artwork and even musical notation of their calls, but no one alive today has the experience of seeing a billion birds fly overhead. The world has changed a lot since Martha's death, but the passenger pigeon hasn't changed along with it. It hasn't had the opportunity to adapt to meet the challenges of this century. And maybe it's the chance to evolve, to shape its own fate in a sense, that's missing. Endlings is filmed in the Harry Plumley studio and was made possible by hundreds of you who supported this idea on Kickstarter. Thank you so much for doing that. We really could not have done this without you. This week, we want to give a special shout out to Bradley. Thank you. We'd like to thank the National Geographic Photo Arc for their help on this episode. Finding images of these critters is not easy, so we really appreciate the ability to work with them to show these animals to you. 